Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my June wrap-up. And as I have been doing recently with my wrap-ups, this will be filmed in two separate parts, so let's get started. The first book I finished in June was Soul Way by Lupita Nyong'o, illustrated by Vashti Harrison. This is a picture book that I actually read digitally from my library, but as soon as I finished it, I ordered a copy online because it was just so gorgeous and I knew I wanted to see the illustrations in person. I knew that I was going to want to reread this one and have a copy on my shelves. And this is a picture book about a young girl named Solway, and she has very dark skin. And because of colorism and racism and the all of these awful ideas that she has grown up being surrounded by because of the society that we live in. She thinks that she is not beautiful because of her dark skin. And then one night she has this kind of experience um, with the night sky and through a story or a tale, um, she comes to realize that she is absolutely beautiful just the way that she is and that there is beauty in her dark skin. And this is just such a gorgeous, gorgeous story, um, the illustrations and the story itself. I don't want to give away too many of the illustrations, but I do want to show you at least one because they were just absolutely stunning. Um, I, I just adored this book and also Under the Dust Jacket is really beautiful, like, like there's stars on the cover. Um, this is just a, a beautiful picture book in the message, um, in the storytelling, in the pictures. I think this is a book that honestly everybody should read um, and I obviously gave Solway five stars. Next I finished Ghost Squad by Clarabel A. Ortega. This book is on voices for the Dominican representation. We follow our main character Lucy and her best friend Sid and they end up casting a spell that accidentally awakens um, malicious spirits in their town of St. Augustine, Florida and they have to go on an adventure to try and get those under control and also to try and save um, Lucy's firefly spirits because in her family um, she can see the spirits of the people in her family who have died um, in the form of fireflies and they can also kind of turn into like ghost forms as well, um, but they seem to be in danger and so Lucy and Sid have to try and protect them and to stop the evil spirits that they accidentally woke up from uh, causing harm to their city. And along the way they get the help of Sid's grandmother Babette who is also a witch and who has a tabby cat named Chunk um, and this is just such a lovely story about friendship and family and also grief. It deals a lot with grief um, and with memory and with moving on and different kinds of grief too, like the difference between um, grieving somebody who has died versus grieving somebody who has left you, like who has left your family and chosen not to come back. Um, and I thought those things were explored in such a thoughtful way. The friendship between Lucy and Sid was really wonderful. Um, I also loved Babette and Chunk. They were just really fantastic characters. And I also think the creepy atmosphere of this book was done really well. There were like several scenes that were like actually very uh, creepy and disturbing to read about. So I think that was done really, really effectively. I also thought the way that issues of race and discrimination were kind of brought into um, this mystery element of the of the story. Because I didn't mention that, there is kind of a mystery element here. Overall, I just think this book was a great balance of the fun elements and the more serious elements, which is something that I really love in middle grade, um, or just books in general really. One of the only things that I thought could have been done maybe a little better or clearer, I don't know if this was just me, but for whatever reason I had a hard time following transitions between scenes sometimes. Um, like there would be new information given that I was pretty sure we hadn't covered, but it was kind of introduced in a way that seemed to be um, hearkening back to an earlier scene, um, or sometimes some of the, like I said, some of the transitions between scenes would be a little bit unclear to me. Um, but other than that, I thought this was just absolutely a wonderful story, and I gave Ghost Squad four stars. Next, I read another picture book, and that is Party by Jamaica Kincaid, and that was illustrated by Ricardo Cortez. And I didn't realize this, but this was actually released later. Like, the illustrations of this were added later, because I think it is actually based on a short story that Jamaica Kincaid wrote. And so basically, this is about um, three black girls who are at some kind of party, and then something happens. Um, and I have to be very vague because in a way the book is somewhat vague. Despite the subtitle of this book, I definitely don't think you should go in expecting a traditional mystery, um, which is kind of what I did. And I actually haven't rated this book on Goodreads because um, I ended up reading some reviews. I'll actually link a specific article or review that I, if I can find it down below. But after reading certain things, I think a lot of these books' importance and meaning comes from these layers um, related to uh, being a black person and just like black identity and culture in particular, especially the way that black girls grow up. And that is something that I obviously cannot relate to or speak to. I do think the art style was gorgeous, so I do really think this was an interesting book. I just didn't feel like it would be fair for me to read it. Next I finished Blue Iris by Mary Oliver and this is a collection of poems and essays. I have talked about Mary Oliver before, she's one of my favorite poets, and I did really like this one. Um, I think so far it's my least favorite of hers, but that being said I still gave it four stars because I do still really love the way that she writes. Um, primarily I think my issue with this one, or not even issue, just like personal preference, is as you probably should have been obvious from the title, this was very heavily focused on nature poems, which I actually can really enjoy. But I feel like the number of them and the way that maybe they were laid out in this book made them feel kind of repetitive after a while. Actually, some of my favorite poems were the ones where she would use um, 
like it, it would seem like a regular nature poem and then you would get to the end and realize that it was actually talking about something else like a deeper layer of meaning in addition to nature um although i still really like the nature ones and actually like i do think it's really important to have um to have poems that are about beauty and just small things and enjoying those small things and that in itself i think is a really important and brave act um so i don't want to like discount the fact that there is just like plain nature poems in this collection but i was just surprised by that a little bit um and i also really liked some of the essays actually there was one in particular about um mary oliver talking about uh her and her friend and their first one of their first experiences i think that got them interested in conservation and in the importance of preserving the natural world and i thought that was really well done um so like i said i gave blue iris four stars not my favorite but still definitely a wonderful collection next i finished pride a pride and prejudice remix by evie zavoy and as you can probably tell this is a modern day retelling of pride and prejudice and this book deals a lot with gentrification our main character is zori benitez and um, the story starts when a new, very wealthy family moves in across the street. This is kind of continuing this um, trend of gentrification in her area, and she's kind of seeing like her neighborhood that she loves um, change and get lost, and she really doesn't like that. She's really upset by that. And in addition to that, um, one of the uh, sons of the family who moves in is Darius, and he is just a total snob, and she can't stand him. But of course, because this is a Pride and Prejudice retelling, even though they clash a lot at the beginning, they end up getting to know each other better. Um, and there's also a like continuing plot about Zuri um, going to college and where she wants to go to college and figuring out what she wants and what she wants to do. And this book ended up being such a surprise for me. Um, I feel like this one gets very mixed reviews overall. And what I had heard from pretty much everyone is that if you like Pride and Prejudice, you probably wouldn't like this book. Um, and I was kind of like nervous about that because I love Pride and Prejudice. So I kind of wasn't sure how I would feel about this book, but I ended up really, really liking it. I feel like the way that Pride took some of the themes of Pride and Prejudice, um, like socioeconomic status and, um, and the class system and everything, and turned that into a story about modern day gentrification and, um, and race and identity and just all of these really topical issues that I feel like make so much sense with the core of what the Pride and Prejudice story is. I just ended up loving that. Um, I loved Zuri as a main character. She's so strong and I really, really love the way that she would do anything for her family. Like she is so deeply connected to home and to her family and to the people that she loves and cares about. And I just really admired her. And I also feel like it's just, it's something we don't see a lot in um, in female main characters who are considered um, very strong and independent is a lot of times they're shown as wanting to get as far away from where they came from as possible. And I liked that Zuri wasn't like that, that we got to see her um, forging her own path and deciding what she wants while also still remaining very um very close to and very focused to on the people that she loves and the places that she loves i also thought her and darius had really really great chemistry and i feel like that kind of made up for some other things in their relationship that maybe weren't quite as well developed like there were several places where i'm like i feel like you guys should have talked about this more or like this conflict should have been um better dealt with or more completely dealt with but i just feel like zori and, and darius's scenes together were so good and had so much chemistry that it like kind of didn't bother me <laughs> like i said i just thought the themes of this book were done in such an interesting and thoughtful way um and the the sense of home and the sense of place here was just incredibly strong and i just really really enjoyed this um the only criticisms i have are like i said i think some of the conflicts were kind of just dropped in a way that felt a little like weird or incomplete some of the side characters felt pretty underdeveloped to me and i think some of that can be explained by the original novel because like in Pride and Prejudice, we're mainly focused on Lizzie and a little bit on Jane out of the Bennett sisters. Um, like Kitty and Lydia and Mary don't get nearly as much time. So I think that makes sense. But I feel like that was ramped up so much in this book that it made characters just feel completely unnecessary. Like her sister Marisol, for example, um, she's known as like Money Love Mari or something like that is her nickname. And literally the only thing she does in this entire book is pop up and talk about how obsessed she is with money. And that just felt very weird. Like the other sisters just felt very, very underdeveloped and some of the other side characters too. And like I said, some of that I think is because of the original novel, like the focus there. But I don't think all of that could be explained by that necessarily. Um, and then the last thing is there's this conflict that happens in Pride and Prejudice that um, is very very important for the book and it's something that I think is really difficult to do in a modern setting. Basically characters have to decide if they're going to tell somebody else about somebody being potentially dangerous. And I feel like in this book, in addition to some other modern retellings I have read, um, I didn't quite feel like that was believable. Like I found it very very hard to believe that Zuri um, wouldn't instantly want to tell and warn people about this person so i don't want to give anything away because of spoilers but i just think that could have been done maybe a little better but even with those things i mentioned i really really enjoyed this and i gave pride four stars next i finished moonkind by sarah Prinius. this is the third and final book 
or like full length book, the Winterling trilogy, I think it's called. And our main character is a girl named Fur, and in the first book in the series, um, she figures out that she can travel between the human world and this kind of fairy or fey world, and when she gets the chance of getting drawn into politics and um, these dangers that that world is facing that is kind of like bleeding over into the human world and she kind of ends up getting tangled up in that and having to fight back and do something about it. And then in the third book um, we are dealing with some consequences for decisions that she made at the end of the second book. Um, and of course I can't say too much about it because of spoilers, uh, but I really really enjoyed this. Like I, I have said that I have enjoyed every book consistently more in this series and I think that's still true. I don't know if, I don't know if two or three is my favorite, but I definitely really enjoyed this one. And one reason is the plot and I'm not usually like a plot focused reader, but I think that the way the story developed in this series was really really good because I really liked that um, that we got to see consequences for first actions without it making it feel like like she made a stupid choice before, like I think these were necessary consequences if that makes sense. And I really like that we got um, the plot of each book resolved in addition to contributing to kind of the ongoing story. Like I just think those things were really well balanced. I also continued to really like this cast of characters. Um, Fur and Rook as main characters I really really enjoyed and the complicatedness of their like tentative like friendship or kind of being allies. Um, there's definitely a lot of obstacles between them. I think those were handled really well and just like as individual characters I found them very interesting. I also really liked that throughout the series we have gotten to see more and more the bond between Fur and her grandmother. Um, that was one of the criticisms I had of the first book is that we were kind of told that she was, that their relationship was very important to them without really being shown it until like near the end of the book. But I think that has definitely improved as the series went on. I continue to really enjoy seeing Fur's like nature magic or healing magic. Um, I don't think we got quite as much of it in this book but I, that's still an element that I really enjoy. And I also really love the side characters in the series and including ones where I did not think I wanted them around as side characters but we saw more of them in this book and I ended up thinking they were a really fun or interesting addition to the series. As far as the very end of this book um, there were some things I liked about the ending more than others but overall I think this is a really satisfying conclusion to the series. It's a series I really enjoyed um, and I also think that this is a good series for people who like fae stories and also people who don't like fae stories but who do like that kind of like forest vibe or like strange um, like non-human creatures kind of thing or who maybe don't necessarily like common fey tropes but they are interested in like this forest like atmosphere and like magic and kind of woodland um, people and things like that. I ended up giving Moonkind four stars. And then right after that I actually read the short story that is kind of like an epilogue. It is set after the trilogy and that is called and that is called Owl by Sarah Prinius. And unfortunately I did not like that one as much. Basically we follow the main characters several years after the events of the third book and just kind of seeing um, like kind of where they're at I guess. And yeah, I didn't really care for this one as much. I do still really like the characters and I was interested in some of the directions that their characters like development had gone or like relationships. Like I did like some of that but overall I was kind of disappointed in this story. Um, I, I kind of feel like the main characters were acting a little bit out of character and some of that could be explained by the fact that there is a time jump of several years but I think maybe there could have been ways to do that better because it kind of like we start the story and we're just like filled in on all of this like all of these changes that had happened in the few years that had elapsed and it's like well why couldn't we maybe have this set um maybe just a shorter time after the third book so we could see some of that developing but the main reason i really didn't like this is because there is a trope in this story that i really really hate it is probably one of my least favorite tropes to read about ever. Um, it's not like unhealthy or problematic or anything, like it's just personal preference. I really hate this trope in stories and the entire premise of this story is that trope which was not indicated in the Goodreads synopsis or even I think in reviews that I had read. Um, so I didn't know going in that this was going to be so prominent in this book or in the story or that it was even going to happen in the story at all. Um, so that was really like the main reason I didn't like this and I also it was kind of annoying too because the way the story went we could have had the exact same story, the exact same character development without having that really frustrating trope. So that was like kind of extra annoying about it. It's like we, we were so close to a story that I could have loved maybe um, or at least enjoyed more than I did. So I ended up giving Owl three stars. Um, it was fine. I wouldn't even say I don't recommend it if you enjoy the series because again like a lot of my feelings about this are very much personal preference. Um, so yeah that was kind of disappointing but overall I still really really enjoyed the series. Next I finished What Mama Left Me by Renee Watson. This is a middle grade contemporary and we follow our main character Serenity and right at the beginning of the book um, we know that her and her brother's mother has just died um, and that their father isn't around either and they're being taken to stay with their grandparents. I think it's her mother's side of the family. And the rest of the book we're slowly starting to put the pieces together about um, about what happened to Serenity and her brother's mother. Um, we know that their family life was really not good. So the rest of the book is about exploring that and Serenity slowly starting to adjust 
um, to living with her grandparents and also her relationship with her brother and also the fact that they're dealing with other people's judgments and assumptions about them like a lot of people kind of assume um, including adults that Serenity is going to end up like her mother um, like people actually like adults actually say that. So this is a book that deals with a lot of issues. Um, as always, I put my trigger warnings in the description box, so be sure to check those out if you have anything you want to know about. Um, but this book deals with a lot of heavy topics and it's pretty short. It's like just over 200 pages. And initially I was a little dissatisfied with how certain elements were handled because it felt like, it felt like some of the issues were um, simplified a little bit or I don't really know how to explain it, but like I was wanting more from it. But after thinking about it more, I think that it actually was done very well in the sense that we're following a kid as she learns about these things because like Serenity and her brother are young and adults don't always tell them everything. So the way that they finally start learning about things, I think it makes sense why it felt a little bit um, less developed than in some other books I've read. I also really loved the relationship um, Serenity developed with her grandparents. Like, they were really, really interesting characters and I really loved seeing how they slowly started to get to know each other and feel more comfortable around each other. And again, going back to the issues this book covers, I really do think it did a good job of showing um, the number of really hard things that a lot of kids have to deal with um, on a daily basis and the way that that affects their lives and the way they view themselves and the way they view their future, um, especially. That was one of the things in this book that I think was done really well is Serenity is so afraid that she's going to end up like her mother or end up like her parents because everybody kind of treats her like she will. Although that said, I did still have some problems with the way that these some of these heavy topics were handled. Like there was one um, very significant one involving Serenity's best friend and even though eventually I feel like Serenity like did the right thing or like responded in the right way, it was incredibly stressful and upsetting to see this go on for so long without Serenity doing anything, even when she knew that she should do something. Some of the character relationships felt very underdeveloped, especially there's this one guy that Serenity has kind of a crush on throughout the book, and it just did not make sense to me. Um, we weren't really given reasons for why she had a somewhat strong attachment to him or like why why her feelings for him were strong enough that she would do things um, that she normally wouldn't. I think there were even some places throughout the book where Serenity thought to herself like, wow, why am I doing this? Like, I don't know why I feel this way. And I was kind of reading the book like, yeah, I don't either. So that was really frustrating. Um, and then certain certain elements of the plot were just frustrating in general. Um, like Serenity's brother. Serenity is the main character and the point of view character in this book. So we definitely don't see as much of her brother as we do of her. But I feel like we just saw enough of him to be annoyed at his choices and not enough to really understand why he was making them. I wish either that his plotline had been done a little differently or that he had been developed in a way where we could understand why he was doing the things he was doing instead of just kind of seeing the aftermath and being frustrated by it. So altogether I liked this. Um, I do plan to read more from Renee Watson but I could have, I think I wanted a little bit more out of this book and I gave What Mama Left Me 3.5 stars. Next I read The Mythic Dream edited by Dominic Parisian and Neville Wolf. This is a collection of short stories by various SFF authors. Um, I actually have a full review on this book where I went like pretty detailed on my feelings for each story because if you saw that you know that I had wildly mixed feelings about this collection. Um, I don't think I've ever read a short story collection or anthology where I had this great a discrepancy um, between my thoughts on the stories. Um, like I had a couple I really loved and I had a few that I really loathed, one in particular I'm thinking of, um, and then kind of a lot that fell just eh, in the middle. Um, so overall I was pretty disappointed in this. I would say a little less than half of this collection are fantasy stories, a little less than half are science fiction stories, which I did not know going in, and then like those few remaining stories I would say were more like historical ones kind of. So I'm not going to go over everything I talked about in the review, but just to sum up, um, I kind of have cap categories of authors. So there were some that I already knew I enjoyed these authors and I continue to enjoy their work here. Those were Shauna McGuire, T. Kingfisher, and Naomi Novik. Some authors that I didn't really know of before or I hadn't really decided if I was going to read something else from them and this kind of sold me on them. I enjoyed it or at least liked it enough that I would be willing to try something else from them. Um, Rebecca Roanhorse, actually this is my favorite thing I've read from her. J.Y. Yang, I was already planning on reading their Tensorate series and I did like their story here. Kat Howard, this really put her on my radar. Um, I really enjoyed her story. Leah Sipes, I have never really heard people talk about and I loved her story. That was my favorite story in the collection so I definitely want to read more from her. Jeffrey Ford, I would be interested to read more from and Alyssa Wong, I really loved her story so I want to read more from her. As for the authors that this has turned me off of, uh, Anne Leckie, Arkady Martin, Stephen Graham Jones, and Amal El Motar, unfortunately. And kind of the authors that fell in the middle for me. Um, Sarah Gailey, I might try something else from them. Like, I kind of wanted to like their story more than I did, but I might try something from them in the future if the synopsis sounds good. Carlos Hernandez, I think I would want to read something else from, so I guess that should be in the other category. Um, Indra Promet Das, not really sure. John Chu, not really sure. And Carmen Maria Machado, I actually skipped her story. Um, for reasons I explained in that review video, I just didn't feel up to reading it. Um, and I have heard amazing things about her work, so I haven't, like, written her off. I just... 
I don't know what I would try from her necessarily. So overall, I gave this collection three stars. Um, yeah, again, check out that review, but lots of lots of mixed feelings on this one. Next, I finished The Black Unicorn by Audre Lorde. This is a collection of poems, and I had this specifically recommended to me by my friend Olivia from Olivia's Catastrophe. She did this really wonderful video where she paired um, booktuber shoutouts or recommendations with book recommendations, and this was the one that she recommended for me, um, and I finally read it, and she was definitely right because I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I have read Audre Lorde's, I think some of her essays before this, but I hadn't really read any of her poetry, so I was really unfamiliar with her work. Like, I didn't realize that her themes were so focused on, like, African folklore and everything. I really enjoyed that. And some of the poems that stood out to me most in this collection actually were um, the more contemporary ones, like the ones where she was talking about um, grief for a particular person that she lost or like a more contemporary setting, I guess, um, because most of this collection was the more um, mythological or historical or folklore focused, which I liked, but I also just really loved those contemporary poems. Some of her poems I think I would have to read more times to really like, feel like I got a little bit of a uh, better understanding about them. Actually, I did reread quite a few poems in this collection because I felt like, like, I feel like I just need to sit with her poetry more, um, so I probably would want to return to this. I also feel like she has a beautiful sense of rhythm in her poetry, um, like, the way that she can communicate, like, the rhythm or the almost feeling like a song, like some of her poetry does, um, the way she can communicate that in her poetry without a lot of punctuation was just like very impressive to me. So I really, really enjoyed this. I um, definitely want to read more from Audre Lorde and I feel like I would get even more out of this collection if I would like return to it and reread it more. Um, that's something I feel with actually quite a few poetry collections. So I could see myself returning to this one too. Next, I finished The Lady's Guide to Celestial Mechanics by Olivia Waite. This is an adult female-female romance and it is a historical romance. We follow two main characters, Lucy and Catherine. And Lucy is an astronomer and her father was too. And for years now, she had been doing the majority of um, her father's calculations and the work that he would send out to people. Um, she started out helping him and she ended up taking over quite a bit of that work. And her father has recently died. And then Catherine, our other main character, um, she is a countess and her husband has recently passed away. And she ends up hiring Lucy to do a translation of this very important French astronomy text and Lucy ends up coming to stay with her and um, they end up getting to know each other and forming a relationship. And I just absolutely adored this book so much. I absolutely loved the themes in this book, which I figured I would because one of the things I had been hearing from people is that this is a book that shows how important women in STEM are and also how important more traditionally feminine pursuits are. Um, I actually, I think, I think the name of this series is the Feminine Pursuits series. Um, so Catherine is an embroiderer and she does these absolutely breathtaking um, pieces. Like she's a truly talented artist, but she doesn't see herself as an artist because traditionally handicrafts have been associated with women and have been um, denigrated and not respected for that reason. Like if they're considered at all, um, they're considered a side hobby or like not really a skill or an art in itself. And to see her, to see Catherine throughout the book learn that what she does is beautiful and important and is just as much, um, it's just as much art as painting or sculpture or anything like that. And also that it's just as important as what Lucy does, you know, charting the skies and making scientific discoveries. It was just incredibly moving and incredibly beautiful. Um, I did not actually anticipate how much I would connect with Catherine. Like I knew I would like the thematic issues surrounding her, like this idea of women's work, but I didn't really predict how much I would really feel her and I would really like just to, just really deeply connect to her character because, because I realize like a lot of my interests or hobbies are more like traditionally feminine things like one of them that I've talked about before is knitting and reading this book I realized how like often I downplay that when I talk to people um, that I don't know as well and I need to stop saying that. <laughs> like I need to own that this is a skill that I have and that I enjoy and that it's important, that it matters. Um, personal tangent aside, I just really loved Catherine. I really enjoyed Lucy too, but um, Catherine was the character that I really saw more of myself in, in regards to what she was going through and also like just the female characters in general in this book were so wonderful. Like basically all of them, except for maybe one, um, were just incredibly supportive of each other. Like to see this this support network of women was just incredibly satisfying and lovely. Speaking of supportive, the romantic relationship was also very supportive and just seeing the way Lucy and Catherine um, got to know each other and they helped each other grow without like making the other person change for them, you know, um, was just really, really lovely. I also really loved Lucy's journey and her seeing her realize that um, 
that she is not the first woman to do these things and that doesn't make it less important. There's one moment in particular I'm thinking of where she has this realization that like she stands on the shoulders of giants, like these women before her, like she comes from a history of women who are doing these things and who are making these important discoveries and who are working in the world even if they're not always given the credit they deserve and it was just like very very powerful to see that, like I almost got choked up a little bit, <laughs> surprising nobody, um, but that was just a really beautiful moment. I also think this book handled some like topical historical issues in a really thoughtful way without making this like a really sad book. Like this is a very, I would say overall, a very like sweet and wholesome queer book, which is really nice to see. Um, but again, it does deal with some more serious things, both related to the LGBT community and not. Like as we see Catherine reflect on her marriage, we see her realize that that this was not okay, that like that she was not in a happy relationship and it was really difficult to to read about that and to see that but it was also done in such a thoughtful and compassionate way and to see her finally realize that she deserves more than that is just like really really beautiful and i loved the way that was done i also want to mention that the romance does have an age gap which normally i'm not a fan of but i feel like the way it was handled here was done really really well because for one thing they are very aware that they have like a, an age gap and like a slight difference in power because Catherine is a countess and all of this um and to some extent lucy is dependent on her at the beginning of the book but I feel like they really work through that in a very believable um, way that felt very healthy and like as somebody who does not like age gaps and romances or like power gaps like that I feel like this one did it really really well and it didn't end up bothering me. I adored this book in case you can't tell. There were a couple of things that I could nitpick about like I wish that the beginning of their relationship had been a little bit slower burned because I really really loved the part where they were like kind of dancing around each other and just getting to know each other. Um, like the romance overall was really wonderful but I would have liked the beginning part to be drawn out just a little bit more. Um, and also that there's that classic like last minute misunderstanding trope. Um, it was brief enough that it didn't bother me though, like it was a very small blip in the overall story but that did frustrate me a little bit. Um, but other than that I absolutely loved this and those problems were not enough to make me give this less than five stars because I just adored this book so much. Next I finished Persuasion by Jane Austen. This was our Austen Anonymous book for June and sadly our last Austen and Anonymous book. Our live show was on Taylor's channel, I will link that down below, and we talked with Tati from Tati the Tiny Booktuber and Nicole from Who Picked This Book. Um, they were the, our guests for that discussion and we just had an absolute blast talking about this book so I will link that down below. Um, but I adored this as I expected. This book is tied for my favorite Jane Austen novel and this is a book where I feel like I love it more and more the older I get um, because there are some parts of it that just hit a lot harder I think. So in this novel our main character is Anne Elliot and several years before the start of the book she was engaged to a sailor named Frederick Wentworth but her family or kind of one of her guardians uh, talks her out of it. Basically they don't think those prospects are good enough for her and that there's too much uncertainty there about like how much money he would make and if he'd be able to support her and everything. So she breaks off the engagement and eight years later their paths end up crossing again and Anne slowly starts to realize that she has never forgotten him, that she still has feelings for him, and she doesn't know if he returns them anymore, or if he's really as indifferent as he seems to be. And I just love this book so much. Um, the yearning in this book, like the angst, is so so good, and I am very particular about romantic angst, but this book is like top-notch. Also, I don't even like second chance romances, and this is one of my favorite novels in the world. So if that's any indication <laughs> of how talented Jane Austen is. I also really love Anne as a main character. Um, she's definitely not one of the most outwardly spunky characters, characters. She's a lot more like Eleanor than Lizzie Bennet, for example, but she definitely still stands up for herself and for what she believes in. And just overall in this last, in the reread for Austin Anonymous, I'm realizing that even Jane Austen's quieter heroines are still so, so strong and they just express that in different ways. And it's definitely how I felt about Anne. Um, I already talked about how much I love the romance. Uh, the humor is always wonderful and the social commentary in this book was fantastic. I feel like even though I tend to think of Pride and Prejudice as the more outwardly feminist book, I feel like in Persuasion we almost got more like direct quotes about um, about women's rights and women's worth, or at least like equal to Pride and Prejudice. Like one of my favorite quotes that I actually marked, this is during a conversation between Anne and a friend of theirs and he has said something like, like, like they're having this kind of friendly argument about if men or women tend to like stay in love longer or to like stay true to their love longer. And the man has brought up books and how like in every book you've ever opened, you know, there's there's a story about women being inconstant. And before Anne can say anything, he's like, but we won't talk about books because you'll probably say they were all written by men, so we can't use them as evidence. And Anne says back, perhaps I shall. Yes, yes, if you please, no reference to examples in books. Men have had every advantage of us in telling their own story. Education has been theirs in so much higher a degree. The pen has been in their hands. I will not allow books to prove anything. 
and like just that whole paragraph and like especially the and like men being able to tell their own story education has been theirs the pen has been in their hands like i feel like there were so many points in this book where it felt like Jane Austen just snapped in like the best way. This was the last novel that she completed before her death and I just feel like she, it almost feels like she was getting to a point in her life or her writing career where she's like, listen, I'm not beating around the bush anymore. Sexism is dumb and I'm gonna tell you why. And I just love that. As you can tell, I loved pretty much everything about this book. Uh, again, check out our live show for more of our full thoughts on the novel, but I gave Persuasion five stars. Next, I finished Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe by Benjamin Aguirre Sanz. And before I get into my review, I do want to mention, I know that there was some um, controversy or discussion about this author. Like apparently he was um, like directly contacting reviewers and challenging their review, which is something that should never happen. Um, and that is definitely not okay. I did get this book from my library and I had already owned a physical copy. So I just wanted to like make that clear and let you guys know so you can decide on your own how you want to approach this author in the future. Um, but into my review of the book specifically, I did listen to this on audio and that's because the narrator was Lin-Manuel Miranda. This is an unvoiced story about two Mexican-American boys named Aristotle and Dante. Um, Aristotle or Ari is actually our main character. For some reason I had assumed this book would be dual points of view, um, but it's actually not. It's just from Ari's perspective. And it's a story about him um, meeting this boy Dante and making friends with him and getting to know him and it's about their relationship over the few over these next few years. I believe this book is also set in the 80s um, and this is definitely not a plot focused story. This is definitely a very very character focused contemporary um, but I really enjoyed that. I'm definitely a character focused reader so this ended up really working for me and I also feel like the characters were really beautifully developed which also helped. Um, Aristotle as a main character like I really liked Ari and this is one of those cases where I think even though audiobooks are hard for me as I've discussed before I am actually really glad I listened to this one on audio because I think, well, Lynn one moment I think did a great job of performing this audiobook. Um, but also I think that if I had read this physically, like Ari is definitely a kind of prickly main character for very good reasons most of the time. Um, and I wonder if reading it physically would have been a little more off-putting than listening to Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, like really perform it and give him that kind of sense of humor and that warmth so that even when he's being like kind of a jerk you still care about him and you still like him. And just the characters overall were wonderful like Dante is just like the most wholesome sunshine bean in the world and I love him. Um, I loved the parents in this book like this has I think some of the best parent characters I have ever read um, and especially seeing the relationship between Ari and his parents and the way that changed throughout the book was just incredibly beautiful and moving and just so thoughtfully done. Um, like I, I just loved Ari's parents and it actually it was kind of frustrating near the beginning of the book like seeing him like just not understand that his parents love him so much. Like you can tell right from the beginning of the book that Ari's parents just love him so much and care about him so much and sometimes the things that they do because I love him and because they want to protect him they're not the best choices. Like you can see how they would lead to Ari feeling very closed off from them and like you definitely understand it but you can still really tell from the beginning that they are really good people and that they really love their son and just seeing them get closer and start to understand each other and open up to each other throughout the book was one of my favorite parts of the book. It was just wonderful. This book also deals with a lot of issues like incarceration. Um, Ari's brother is in prison and we really see the toll that has taken on him and on his parents and especially on their relationship with each other. It also deals with queer identity, especially in the 80s. Also with Latinx identity, um, like we see that Dante has a very complicated relationship with his Mexican background and Ari does too to an extent but Ari seems to be a little bit more comfortable with it than Dante is and so seeing them discuss that throughout the book was also really interesting. Also some of the side characters in this book were fantastic. Um, Ari makes friends with two girls at school. I can't remember their names. I think one of them was Gina but shockingly they ended up being like characters I really really loved even though when they're introduced you really really don't like them. So that was really fun. I loved the relationship between Ari and Dante and how that developed throughout the book. Um, I did also like the writing. I feel like it really suited this kind of introspective and character focused story without being like over the top or over flowery or anything. There were really only two things that I didn't like about this book. One of them is at one point one of the characters kind of forces the other character to kiss them. Like the other character is literally saying like no I don't want to, no stop it and they do it anyway. And it's kind of brushed off as like we're supposed to feel like it's okay because the character who was pressured into it didn't end up minding and I just didn't like that. Um, and then the other thing is right at the end there's this very significant like character moment that happens or like realization which I liked but it kind of felt like it was driven by other people. I think it makes sense that people like talking to people can help us come to realizations about things or like come to realize things about ourselves. Like I think that makes sense and that definitely happens but just the way it was done in this book I would have liked it if it had felt a little bit more like the character 
was realizing it themselves, like coming to that conclusion themselves. But overall, I did still really enjoy this, and I gave Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe four stars. And finally, the last book I finished in June was This Beast, and that is War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Uh, this was a buddy read with my friend Julia from Shakespeare and such, and I'm really glad that I buddy read this, <laughs> that we had each other to like keep each other motivated because uh, like this was obviously quite a project throughout the month. I'm gonna actually put this down while I talk about it because this is incredibly heavy. So we're just gonna start with my list here. So I really have no idea how to summarize this book because it's obviously very long and there's a lot that happens in it. Um, like there's a lot of different characters that are important in the story, but I think the part of the story that more people know because of Great Comet the Musical, but also just like cultural knowledge, is one of our main characters, Natasha, and kind of the uh, romantic entanglements she gets into, but this book is not just about that and I almost I almost regret describing it that way because because I don't want it to sound like this book is mainly about the romance because even though that's important and relationships in general in this book are super important, there's just so much that this book covers that focusing on any one part of the story feels a little bit misleading to like what the book is about as a whole. So maybe I should just tell you how I felt about it. So I had very mixed feelings on this book because some things I absolutely loved and some things I hated and kind of fill me with rage. Um, so first off, I am really glad that number one, I buddy read this with a friend, Julia, and number two, that I already knew and loved Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, which is a musical. It's one of my favorite musicals, and it is actually adapted from this very small chunk of War and Peace. I would actually recommend doing both of those things if you plan to read this book. I would recommend reading it with a friend so you can discuss it, and I also think it helps if you enjoy the musical or if you're even just familiar with the musical, because I think having a connection to these characters Characters before you go into this novel. Um, I think that would really help you. It definitely really helped me and my kind of emotional investment in these characters helped carry me through some of the slower parts, um, which we're getting to, because it is war and peace. And I know it's dumb that I did not expect there to be that much war in this book, but in my defense, all of the, th all of the parts of this book people always talk about are the peace parts, because those are the interesting parts, because those are the parts that actually focus on like characters and like the people you care about and doing interesting things. And this translation is translated, annotated, and introduced by Richard Peviar and Larissa Volokonsky. Um, and I really, really liked this translation. Um, I really liked the writing in this book, which I think is a credit to the author and the translators. Um, it was very, it flowed very well. It was very easy to read, which is what I had been hearing from people is that like Russian classics are not difficult to read. They're just really long. Um, and I feel like that was the case here. And another thing I'll say in Tolstoy's favor is the book was not long for no reason. Like, except for some of those war parts, which I think really could have been shortened some, um, the like he really took the time and he used the page space he had to really develop these characters to really develop these relationships and to say really interesting things about life and about relationships and um like death and revenge and forgiveness and all of these other things like he used all of that massive page time for a good purpose. And then speaking of the characters and relationships, that was probably one of my favorite things about this book. Like I got so, so attached to these characters, even ones that like based on like things from the musical and also just like the way they're introduced. I had kind of like written them off a little bit or just kind of assumed that they wouldn't be characters I cared about very much. And boy, did I change my mind because there are some of these characters who I could not stand at the beginning, who I ended up being incredibly attached to. And if something bad like would happen to them or like I'd be worried th something was going to happen to them, it would be like very intense because I grew to love these characters so much. And the relationships in this book are also fantastic. Like the friendships, we have a couple of really strong friendships between Pierre and Andre and Natasha and Sonia. And just like the characters themselves, like Pierre's arc was so interesting. I was really like Natasha. Um, again, like I had those characters I ended up really changing my mind on uh, throughout the book. Also, Princess Maria just has my whole heart. She is just the sweetest, most precious bean, and I just want good things for her. Um, Anatole is like such a troublemaker, but I kind of liked him anyway. And just these characters are so so richly developed. Also going back to the writing, um, there's quite a bit of humor that I wasn't anticipating, which I really enjoyed. And also, I am not like a quotes person. I always want to be a quotes person, but I'm too lazy to write them down and collect them. <laughs> so, so generally I can't really think of like favorite lines from books necessarily, but I have a favorite line from this book that I memorized without even trying. And I think it has to be like one of the saddest and most beautiful like romance lines or proposal lines in anything I have read ever. And even though I said I know this quote by heart, I might have to paraphrase a little bit because depending on the translation, it's a little different, but it's the one that goes, if I were not myself, but the handsomest, brightest, best man on earth, and if I were free, I would get down on my knees this minute and ask you for your hand and for your love. And I just, like that moment in the book was just like a lot because I think the line by itself is really good, but 
especially because of the character who says it and the character they say it to and just like the circumstances surrounding that conversation it was just like very emotional and really beautiful and just like hit you right in the feelings in the best way. Anyway, as you can see, I was very emotionally invested in this book, which was kind of a pleasant surprise because I wasn't sure I would have that emotional connection to this book, but obviously I did. And then another thing about the relationships is Tolstoy is so good at number one, just kind of making you ship everybody, <laughs> and number two, like constructing these very believable and very well done relationships or interactions in like just a couple pages or a couple scenes. Like Sonia and Dolokhov had maybe two interactions, so like were they a significant part of the novel? No. But am I reading Sonia and Dolokhov fanfiction now? Yes. I just feel like that's a mark of how well he can like sell you on characters and their relationships in so short a time. Okay, so now getting into the things that I did not like, because I've done a lot of gushing, but like I said, I did have some mixed feelings about this book. Um, the war parts, like, they could have been shortened a lot. Um, like, I, I think I understand some of what he was trying to get at by showing all of these war scenes, and some of them were really interesting and were done really well and said very interesting things about, like, the human condition and, like, history and wars and, like, who causes wars and versus who fights in wars and everything. But there was a lot I think that could have been shortened or um, t done in a more interesting way. But my biggest issue and the thing that, like, actively makes me angry about this book and the reason that I have such mixed feelings about this book is the epilogue. Um, the part that follows, like there's kind of two parts to the epilogue. One is like very philosophical and theoretical which had some interesting stuff, some also some not so interesting stuff, but the part I'm talking about is the part that actually follows the characters and there were some things in that section that I loved, specifically involving Maria, and then there were some things that I just, I am so angry and disgusted at and like like even thinking about that part um, and how certain characters end up and the way that that is treated is just like making me furious um, and I can't go into really specific details because of spoiler reasons so all I'm gonna say is like some parts of that epilogue I'm like if I had not read those this would have been like a strong four stars and because of that ending I'm like I cannot give this four stars I have this drop down to like a 3.5 like I don't know, depending on my mood, it might even be closer to a three stars, but there were some things that I really liked, so I don't know. Like, I just have so many feelings about this book, and believe it or not, even though I have been yapping about this book for probably way too long in this wrap-up, I still have more things to say about it, so I probably will just end up doing, like, a review discussion on War and Peace because I have, like, I have, like, some specific things I need to say and talk about with this novel. Um, I actually thought about running a poll and asking you guys if you wanted to see that, but... <laughs> I basically decided I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, so hopefully some of you at least are interested in that. But um, yeah, that was War and Peace. I gave it 3.5 stars, I think. Um, it was an experience. Really glad I read it. Loved some of it. Hated some of it. I... I'm just conflicted. Okay, everybody, so those are all of the books that I read in June. Please let me know if you have read any of these books, what you thought of them. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!